You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, Chapter Leadership Committee member of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. Hello, Jeremy. This is episode 119 of Lighthearted, and this is May 16th, 2021. We'll be speaking with two guests about the very iconic Montauk Lighthouse in New York. First, what has happened on this date in lighthouse history? On May 16, 1898, North Head Lighthouse in Washington was lighted for the first time. The first keeper at North Head, Alex Paysonen, remained in charge for 26 years. He had a female second assistant keeper named Mabel Hatch Bretherton. Her husband, Bernard Bretherton, had been the principal keeper at the Coquille River Lighthouse in Oregon. When her husband died in 1903, Mabel was left with 10 children. She was appointed as an assistant keeper at Cape Blanco in Oregon before coming to North Head. At Cape Blanco, she was the first woman keeper in the state of Oregon. I visited North Head in 2015. Uh, That lighthouse is in a beautiful spot at the entrance to the Columbia River. The tower has been restored in recent years, thanks largely to the efforts of the nonprofit Keepers of the North Head Lighthouse. Also, the American marathon runner, Joan Benoit, was born in Cape Elizabeth, Maine on May 16, 1957. She once said, quote, every time I fail, I assume I will be a stronger person for it, unquote. So, as I mentioned, we're heading to Montauk, New York for this episode. Our guest will be Mia Chertich, Executive Director of the Montauk Historical Society and author historian Henry Osmers. Located at the eastern tip of Long Island, Montauk Point Light is the oldest lighthouse in New York and the fourth oldest active lighthouse in the country. In the late 1700s, New York Harbor was first among American ports in the volume of its foreign trade, which led to the authorization of a light at Montauk Point by the Second Congress and President George Washington in 1792. Construction began in 1796 and was completed in the following year. The sandstone tower was changed substantially in 1860 when it was raised in height from 80 feet to its current 111 feet. A new larger lantern was installed to provide room for a first order Fresnel lens. The current keeper's dwelling was built next to the tower at the same time. The tower was originally all white until a brown stripe was added in 1899. A a three-and-a-half order bivalve Fresnel lens replaced the first order lens in 1903, and that in turn was replaced by rotating arrow beacons in 1987. Today, the still active light is produced by a rotating VRB25 optic. U.S. Coast Guard keepers served at the light station from 1946 until it was automated in 1987. In that same year, a museum opened in the Keeper's House, operated by the Montauk Historical Society. Then, in 1996, ownership of the light station buildings was transferred to the Historical Society. For many years, the light station has been threatened by the erosion of the bluff on which it stands. It was 297 feet from the edge when it was first built, and only about 90 feet today. A series of erosion control measures have been carried out, including a current revetment project costing more than $30 million and being implemented by the Army Corps of Engineers. In addition, recent restoration work on the Lighthouse Tower included the complete repointing of the tower's masonry, as well as the removal of earlier coatings and the application of new exterior paint. Montauk Point is one of only a dozen lighthouses in the U.S. to be designated a National Historic Landmark. The museum in the 1860 Keeper's House features an assortment of historic photos and documents, including the authorization signed by President Washington in 1796. Mia Chertich became the executive director of the Montauk Historical Society in April 2020. She is a writer and screenwriter who's lived in California for many years, but she's spent every summer in her life at Montauk. She also has a background in advertising and public relations, fundraising for nonprofits, and teaching high school in her native New Jersey. Henry Osmers first visited Montauk Lighthouse when he was seven years old, and he was hooked. Many years later, in 2001, he became a tour guide at the site. He's now the official historian for the lighthouse, and he's written four books about Montauk history. One of them, On Eagle's Beak, published in 2008, was the first major history of the lighthouse. I spoke with Mia Chertich and Henry Osmers in April. Let's listen to that conversation now. 
I am speaking today with Mia Chertich, uh, the executive director of the Montauk Historical Society, and Henry Osmers, the historian from Montauk Lighthouse and uh, author as well. Uh, so thank you so much for being with me today, uh, Mia and Henry. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mia, let's start with you. And uh, I understand your association with Montauk, with uh, that part of Long Island, started when you were very young. How, d- how did all that start? I think I was seven years old uh, the first time I came here. Uh, my parents bought a house. They were, they were kind of... Um, there was a group of houses that were developed um, through Macy's, actually, and um, and Raymond Lowy, the designer, and there were these 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 summer houses that came com- equipped with everything down to the toothbrush. My mother was studying interior design. She wandered into Macy's. She saw it there. They were offering a free weekend in Montauk for anybody who wanted to look at it. My parents came and they bought it, and and that was it. That became that began the the love affair that's gone on ever since then. So, Mia, what led you to your position as the executive director of the Montauk Historical Society? I'm very interested in history, and I'm particularly interested in historical research. And I found that out through working, actually, through through writing documentaries, and that I found that my favorite part was always getting getting to the story and finding things out that I hadn't known before. Uh, and I always researched far more than I needed to, just because that was sort of the fun part for me. Um, so, you know, I've been drawn to to historical societies in general. When I found out that the Montauk Historical Society was going to hire its first ever executive director, and I was thinking I would quite like to be in Montauk. My sister lives here. My kids, uh, one of my daughters lives in England. So I I had been living on the West Coast. East Coast was a better place for me to be. And I thought, what a great, what a great thing to do, to live in Montauk and work for the Historical Society. It It was just like a dream come true. So let's talk a little bit more about the Historical Society. Obviously, managing the uh, the Lighthouse property is a, a large part of what it does. But what are some of the other things the Historical Society does? Well, we have um, three museums that we oversee. The Museum at the Lighthouse and, of course, the entire Lighthouse and property. Uh, the Montauk Indian Museum, which is the most recent museum to us. We opened it, I think it was 20. 20- 13, 2014? It was around that time, yeah. Um, And the third is Second House, which is so called because as you came into Montauk in the 18th century, uh, it was actually the second house you came to. It was a a house that had been used by livestock keepers. At that time, Montauk was largely pasture land. And so people from East Hampton, the proprietors of East Hampton, would bring their cattle and sheep here to graze. And they passed through these two houses on their way to the final house. So like first house, they checked them for to see if people were bringing in the appropriate number of animals. At second house, they separated the cattle from the sheep. And then at third house, I think that was just mainly cattle grazing. That Those were the fattening fields in there. So second house is undergoing a, a huge historical restoration and museum is not open, but we are in the process of planning a new museum, which is a very exciting prospect. Besides that, at the, light, the Lighthouse really is, at the moment, with Second House closed, um, the Lighthouse is probably the most significant part of our uh, society, uh, certainly in terms of the things that we do and the activities that we have. We have events, we have musical, artistic, literary. Uh, we're going to be uh, hosting some book signings of books that are maritime related by local authors. Uh, this summer, we have um, small concerts, large concerts. We have a triathlon. So we do a lot of stuff at the Lighthouse. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, part of that, of course, is to to fulfill our mission, which is education. And part of it is also to support the Lighthouse uh, because we, you know, we have to find a way to maintain it. Additionally, we've done, uh, Henry and I last year worked together on uh, creating curriculum during the beginning of COVID when everybody was having to cope with distance learning. We created some local history lessons for the kids in Montauk, for the Montauk school. And then eventually that actually extended. Uh, We kept focused on Montauk, but it was also used in uh, neighboring schools, Amagansett and Bridgehampton and Sag Harbor. Henry, I want to turn to you for a while. And Also, like Mia, I believe your uh, love for Montauk Lighthouse goes way back in your life uh, when you were something like seven years old, if I remember correctly. Can you tell me a little bit about that? 
Yeah, uh, coincidentally, seven years for you and uh, for me and seven years for me. Uh, I was seven years old when I first came out here. I didn't live on the east end of Long Island. I lived closer to New York City. Uh, so it was about a 100-mile drive just to get out here. And uh, I guess I was just taken with the first time I saw the lighthouse from the, from the foot of the driveway by the front gate. My father, I remember, he, he picked me up and put me on top of the uh, rail fence that was down there and uh, took a picture of me. It's funny, after all these years, I never thought that much about the picture, but it's, it's certainly uh, gotten legs and it's uh, become a, a popular uh, image. But I, I never forgot that first time. And when I was old enough to drive and date, uh, I, I used to take a couple of girlfriends out here, the last one of which became my wife. And, you know, so it, it's had a special place for that. Uh, we have a group of friends, my wife and I, that we've known for almost 50 years. And it was like an annual pilgrimage to come out here every year and have a picnic. We did that for many, many years. There's a lot of personal memories that have uh, tied up with the, the Point area, not just the lighthouse, but the state park that's right adjacent to it. I should, I should just say, we, we posted a picture of Henry when he was seven years old sitting on the fence and right next to it, a, post, a picture of Henry um, now. And mm -hmm. I think that was the most popular Facebook post we've ever had. We had <laughs> 70,000 people were reached by so it. Was, wow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I'm sure they're all all fans of, of yours, Henry. So that's why they liked it so much. That's great. He has a lot of fans. Well, if it's good for the lighthouse, that's the way I look at it. I mean, I sure. thought I looked pretty cute when I was seven. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, well. Yeah, it, it's been a it's been uh, I guess to put it as easy as possible. It's been a fun ride. I've been I've been working here for 21 years. Uh, I don't live in Montauk now either. I live in a town called Shirley, which is uh, 60 miles away. And that tra that journey can be very challenging at certain times of the year. Uh, we're going into it now, so it takes a little longer to get out here. But it's still something I enjoy doing. Visitors ask me, you know, sometimes how I deal with the traffic. And I just say, um, look, I just get used to it because I know what's waiting for me at the end of the trip. Right, right. That's some good incentive there. So uh, I have your book uh, on Eagle's Beak right near me here, and we'll talk more about that, the book, in a minute. But I, I read in the preface that you had – well, you kind of alluded to it a few minutes ago, but uh, maybe we can get a little more detail. You had a very important visit to the Montauk Lighthouse in 1970. Uh, what happened at that time? Oh, that was the first time that a group of us uh, got together and went out there. My wife and I and this – small group of other people all worked at a very large department store uh, in Elmont, Long Island, which is where we all became very, very close friends. And we still see each other today. We were all cashiers in the store. It was just weird how it worked out. My wife and I ended up getting married and two other couples matched up and they're married. So we're all married almost 50 years now. And each of us have two children and we all have girls. That's great. Yeah, so it, it, the memories of Montauk aren't as numerous now, you know, when we get together, but every once in a while, hey, remember when? And we, you know, we kind of go back to that. And it, it, it's kind of sweet. We, we, we like to remember those early days. Sure. And could you say a little bit more about how you uh, or what led you to become a guide at the, uh, the light station? Well, in the years after we got married, you know, we had uh, two daughters and occasionally we would still drive out here, not as often, but. Um, uh, I still had that interest in the lighthouse. And one day I had heard, or I'm a little fuzzy on that. I, I, I think I had heard that they were looking for tour guides at the lighthouse. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, I'd, I'd really like to look to check into that. And, you know, I had a regular job at the time and I figured, well, maybe I could just do it like on Saturdays. And since it was a museum, my first thought was that it's probably volunteer. So I'm thinking, you know, one day a week, it's not a big deal. I'll take the drive out. So I went out. I applied for the job. They hired me at that that day. And the director at the time said to me, OK, now I'm going to tell you what your pay is. And I said, excuse me. <laughs> and then he told me, you know, there was so much an hour. And I and then he explained that it was important that the tour guides be there because of the volume of visitors we get. Uh -huh. And. So then he said, we, we feel that, you know, if we pay the people that work there, 
that'll maybe be an incentive for them to show up. And uh, then he just smiled at me and he says, do you have a problem with that? And I said, certainly not. Cause I figured right away, well, there, that covers my gas expense, you know, for right. travel. And it grew from there. I mean, occasionally I would do a Sunday also, if it was a busy time or if they needed me, uh, I had only worked there for a month and they asked me to be the uh, tour director. And at, at that point I thought, well, what does that entail? And they said, simply speaking to groups and telling them about the history of the lighthouse. And he says, do you think you can do that? And I said, yeah, I mean, I'd done enough reading about it. They gave us a manual when we started, which gave you the basics, but I wasn't satisfied with that. That's when my my master's in history, I think, kicked in. And I just started doing some digging. And one night I went home and I said to my wife, I said, you know, there's so much history about that lighthouse. I said, I'm surprised nobody ever wrote a book about it. Mm. And she just looked me straight in the eye and says, well, why don't you? <laughs> yeah. And at first I kind of dismissed the idea, but then I thought, you know, why not? I mean, no, who says I can't do it? I'll try. I made sure I had a good editor close by. And uh, it, it resulted in uh, Eagle's Beak. Uh, the book yeah. you have in front of you, uh, I'm assuming, is the, uh, is the more recent one. I, I had done a second edition of it. It yeah. was the first one was done in 2008 and did not include uh, the important information about how we became a national historic landmark. That's one of the things that led me to do uh, an update of the book. And then from that book followed four others, which uh, I've kind of eased back a little bit now. But, you know, I, all four of them are offered at the gift shop at the, the lighthouse and they're available, you know, in the, the usual channels, Amazon, you know, and that sort of thing. Well, the uh, the book on Eagle's Beak is uh, certainly a, a great book. You did a, a wonderful job with it. Uh, it's the history of the lighthouse, of course, and some other history of uh, Montauk Point area. And uh, I have to ask you, what does that title mean on Eagle's Beak? Where does that come from? That actually was from a, a poem by uh, Walt Whitman, who uh, loved Montauk. He went out there on occasion. I guess uh, for inspiration, and uh, he was sitting at the top of the hill one day and uh, wrote this short poem. I can't recite it. It's in the book, but I stand as as if on some mighty eagle's beak. That's how he opened it. And that just spoke to me as as a nice uh, title. I know it ended with uh, him saying that inbound, inbound urge of waves seeking the shore forever. It's mm. beautiful. It's only maybe about eight lines, but mm-hmm. it, it's just, it's short, but it's it's really sweet. So let's talk a, a little bit about the history of the Montauk Peninsula and, of course, the, the lighthouse. Uh, obviously, there's a, a long and, and really interesting history of both the, the point and the lighthouse. We're only going to scratch the surface today, of course. And I would recommend your, your book on Eagle's Beak and your other books to anybody uh, interested in this subject. If we could just say, uh, just maybe briefly, if, if that's possible, besides the lighthouse, what's important about the Montauk Peninsula? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> better put a pot of coffee on. <laughs> Montauk, to me, is, is very unique. It developed in a way unlike any other town would. It was a remote location for many years. I mean, few people wanted to travel out this far because it was too challenging. It, it was lonely. It was desolate. And in the summer months, you could get eaten alive by mosquitoes just trying to get here. So it really wasn't uh, that appetizing, at least from my perspective. And it wasn't until really the uh, the late 19th century into the 20th century that the ability to get to Montauk was uh, made a, a little more uh, attractive and a little more uh, manageable uh, to the point where when cars came along, that uh, a cinder road was uh, built to uh, cross an area that's called Nappy, which you have to pass through to get to the Montauk Point Peninsula. And crossing Nappy was about four or five miles of sandy desert in those early days. If there was any kind of vegetation, it was very scant. And that's basically where uh, the mosquitoes would have their way with you if you tried crossing. You know, and then in the 20th century, you know, uh, uh, a man by the name of Carl Fisher came out here, and he had visions of Montauk being a summer playground for the wealthy, uh, Fisher being the man who built the city of Miami Beach, and he kind of promoted the idea of uh, Miami Beach in winter, Montauk Point in summer. That was his promotion. 
And to that end, he started to build Montauk, which included the uh, Montauk Manor, which is a beautiful hotel sitting on top of a hill, has a panoramic view in all er all directions. But like many visionaries like him in the 1920s, they all went for naught because of the infamous 29 stock market crash. Uh, Fisher, by various sources, was worth upwards of 50 or $60 million in the 1920s, which is quite a lot of money in those days. And when he died in 1939, his estate was valued at $40,000. So he, he was an example of how uh, some of the rich really uh, just fell drastically from uh, a very, very successful careers. And then, I mean, there was the military out here is very significant because uh, one of my books, American Gibraltar, refers to the role Montauk played in the wars of, of the United States, beginning with the Indian Wars and going through the Cold War period. I think because of Montauk's location geographically, how it juts out into the Atlantic, it was very strategic, militarily speaking. And I think that came to light more than any other war than the Second World War, because then you had the Army, the Navy, and the Coast Guard out here, and you had a, an Army base that was called Camp Hero, which was actually adjacent to the Lighthouse property, and the, the camp itself, uh, being an Army base, also contained four 16-inch guns, which are like these huge cannons, and they could fire a shell that weighed over 2,000 pounds, a distance of 30 miles with point accuracy. And at the lighthouse property, there was a structure, or I should, well, it's still there. Uh, it was called a fire control tower, which was basically a radar lookout tower. And that they would monitor the ocean for the presence of any German submarines. And there were other such uh, structures in the area of Montauk and the East End. And many of them coordinated firepower with Camp Hero. So in other words, they would send the information to Camp Hero where these enemy vessels might be located. And then the guns would be trained on those spots and they would simply fire away. Uh, the guns were fired, but only for practice. There was never an actual engagement out here. But at least the, knowing that the guns were there uh, was uh, a great feeling of security for the East End. Uh, there are many who question, why did they need all that out here when nobody was out here? And I said, well, that's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. The enemy could have seen this as a likely landing spot because they would they would meet up with little if any resistance so that's why the area was built up to the point it was and when the war ended i mean the army left here the coast guard stayed here to uh, run the lighthouse the navy left and the only branch i didn't mention was the air force and they came in in the 50s took over much of camp hero property which became the montauk air force station so during the cold war period you had a, a huge 40-ton dish swinging around up in the up in the uh, area there, and that was monitoring the coastline for an area up to almost 300 miles out to sea wow. in, the, the, in the event of any uh, unauthorized or uh, strange uh, uh, pl airplanes or other uh, poss possible uh, craft coming to shore. And then with the development of satellite technology, you know, things all kind of changed. And Camp Hero shut down by 1981. And your military presence was basically gone from here. Montauk was also significant because many shipwrecks occurred in these waters. I have a book that I did called Legacy of Valor, which really focuses on 120 shipwrecks. That wasn't all of the wrecks that happened out here. Those are just the ones that were documented to, to the extent that it was worth mentioning. Even though you had the wrecks out here, you should also not forget that there were life-saving stations out here where small groups of men patrolled the beaches looking for ships in distress in the 1800s into the 20th century. Uh, the life-saving service was actually the forerunner of today's Coast Guard. Uh, but again, with new technology and fast and the development of uh, speedboats, it wasn't necessary to have so many life-saving stations around. And most of them, if not all, just shut down. And then you just have limited Coast Guard installations, which handle larger areas with that newer equipment. I do want to just point out that before all of this, um, we had a native uh, tribe living here, and they were the Montaukets, and that's where we get our name from. They were... <laughs> declared extinct 
in the end of the 19th century, I believe, or beginning of the 20th century. Um, actually, I think 1910 was the court decision. Uh-huh. Yeah. But um, they're not extinct. They were here first, and they were here for, for thousands of years. Actually, on that subject, uh, yeah, the Montaukets uh, were the most powerful Indian tribe on Long Island. Uh, yet when the settlers came this way, uh, it was they who uh, helped teach the uh, settlers uh, the art of whaling, as went the way of many Indians. You know, the land was sold, in, in Montauk's case, uh, on three different occasions to uh, groups of men from uh, East Hampton, who, uh, some of which became known as the Montauk proprietors, and they oversaw the cattle and sheep that were grazing out here through those three houses that, you know, that Mia mentioned before. Uh, the land was sold to these men in, I believe, in 1661, and, and the last one—I forget the middle year—but the last one, I believe, was 1687. And today, there are just scattered remnants of Montauks, no pure bloods, uh, many of them marrying into the African American population. So the, that pure strain had, basically has vanished from out here. But there are quite a number of Montaukets in general that uh, live in uh, here on the East End. Oh, it's so much. You know, I thank you for that that capsule history. And obviously, there's rich, just such rich history there from the Native Americans right through uh, up, up to the present. You should maybe do a podcast uh, series about uh, the whole history of, of Montauk. I think you'd have uh, endless material to talk about there. But of course, there's also your books. And uh, Well, as they say, the, the expression goes, and I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you could, and I'd love to listen to it. But we should, this is a, a podcast uh, primarily about lighthouses. So we should probably uh, talk some more about the lighthouse. And l- let me ask you, you talked about what a strategic place Montauk Point is for the military, which probably relates to why it's such a good place for a lighthouse. Uh, so could you maybe add a little bit about why it is, uh, why it was considered such a good place for really one of the first lighthouses in the United States? Well, uh, I see Montauk Point as a, a very strategic location because really after the American Revolution c- came to an end, shipping between some European countries to New York began to flow. And the path that uh, many of them took went right by Montauk Point, heading along the South Shore towards New York. Unfortunately, a number of those ships, because of perhaps poor weather conditions, probably mostly because of poor weather conditions, uh, wound up running up on rocks or uh, grounding on the beach, beaches uh, along the east end of Long Island. And without a lighthouse to give them their bearings, that was that was the result. And the result was more far-reaching than just causing damage to the ship, because not only would the ship possibly be lost, but so would cargo and people. The concern was naturally for the people, of course, but there was also concern for the loss of cargo, because the city of New York was growing at that point. Uh, the year 1792 is significant because that is the year that the New York Stock Exchange was formed, and many of the investors at that time invested in overseas trade. So you can see where some of the interest in having a lighthouse built would come from. Ship captains wrote letters to the federal government, basically supporting the idea of a lighthouse to, to enable these ships to successfully complete their voyages. Uh, There were some people who felt that the lighthouse was not needed there and should be built elsewhere, and letters were written to that effect. But the majority of the the support was from Montauk. So in 1792, George Washington approved the building of a lighthouse. He commissioned it. And on April 12th, it was signed by Thomas Jefferson, who was the Secretary of State at that time. Uh, We own that original letter. And four years later, George Washington signed a letter, a document, I should say, that was for the purchase of 13 acres at Montauk Point for a light station. We own that letter as well. Uh, Those are two very significant documents we have on display uh, at the lighthouse. In truth, we have replicas on display because of the value of the documents. They are kept in in another area, which is climate controlled and also much more secure. Not to say that our museum is not secure, but it's not climate controlled to the point where the documents can be comfortable. But we have the copies displayed in a prominent central location in our uh, front parlor, which is sometimes referred to by the staff as the documents room. It's pretty accurate. 
So the Montauk, the, the, the point itself is kind of like a junction to me, because when ships came there, they could either go to the left of the lighthouse, which would mean along the south shore of the island, or to the right of it, which would lead towards Long Island Sound, Block Island Sound first, and then Long Island Sound, and they would go to points west that way. The tower was designed by John McComb, M-C-C-O-M-B. Uh, is there anything especially notable about John McComb? Yeah, uh, he was considered one of the uh, foremost uh, architects and builders of his time. I, I like to talk about him a little bit at the, at, when I'm at the lighthouse because I'm just amazed at what he accomplished. I mean, he only built three lighthouses. I think, truth be known, he found it more lucrative to build homes and churches and buildings like that in New York. City Hall in Manhattan was one of his accomplishments. He actually collaborated with a French architect to uh, complete that. And he, as I say, he built a number of other historic uh, structures, including Gracie Mansion in New York, which is the, gut, which is the uh, mayor's home. But what's amazing about the lighthouse is that uh, aside from him being the winning bidder on the project, it took him and a crew of 50 men to build the lighthouse in only five months. This was an 80-foot tall sandstone tower, plus building a keeper's dwelling, digging a well for a water supply, and constructing uh, an outhouse. Well, you got to count that too. It's a structure. But all of these things were accomplished in that five-month period. Wow. And he was very thorough. He did compile a list of items that he felt he would need to the job which included 500 gallons of rum. Uh -huh. These men were English, yeah. and rum being a staple. Uh, we, we all laugh about that because we figured that was the incentive to get them to come to work every day. Yeah. But to accomplish the feat in five months, uh, I'm just amazed at myself. But there was that old saying years ago that you work from sun up to sundown, and I imagine they probably uh, kept that going. Yeah. They also did it between June and November, so you got to figure there were a lot of good months to be outside there. Right, and long but days. The weather must have been in their favor, I would imagine. They brought all the stone in by, by boat and then built a road to take it up the hill, and it was, so it was all brought up by oxen. It's, mm. it's kind of mind-boggling to think that there was that technology, and yet this was built in five months, you know? It, it is. It's a, absolutely incredible. It would probably take five years yeah. today. <laughs> well, and, uh, well, as somebody said, I never forgot it, a visitor said these days it takes five years just to agree to do a job. <laughs> That's true too. And uh, I hate to think of how much money it would cost today. To, well, to back then it was $22,300, which I did did look that up about a year or so ago. And mm -hmm. I think in today's money, I think it was just under 500000 this is what George Washington was supposedly said to have said. I don't know how true it is, but he said, build something that will last 200 years. If the, if the erosion problem that we had at the lighthouse had not been corrected when it was, that Washington's prediction might have been correct or close to it. Yeah, yeah, maybe pretty much right on the nose. So let's talk about the human history a little bit. And uh, this is for Henry, but Mia, you can certainly uh, add to this if, you, if you'd like. I'm wondering about uh, what life was like there for the keepers and their families. You know, it was, it was uh, certainly pretty isolated in those days. How isolated was it for the families there? And was, was it a, a relatively comfortable place to live? If you compare it to an offshore lighthouse, I would say, yeah, it was probably more comfortable. It, it, it had its problems. I mean, like any lighthouse would. I mean, there were uh, time to time health issues that came up with the lack of uh, access to uh, any kind of care and uh, attention. Uh, you know, the, the death rate, especially among children, was quite great in those days. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a strong uh, infant mortality rate uh, among lighthouse keepers' families. Uh, there was one keeper in particular who had 14 children. Uh, now, all 14 of them were not with him at the lighthouse, but uh, it, during the course of time, I believe it was five or six of them that I, had died at young ages. It took six hours to get here by uh, horse and cart from the nearest town. It took six mm -hmm. hours to get to the lighthouse. Yeah, that town she's referring to would be East Hampton, and that's a 20-mile that's a drive. You know, that's a, a lot can happen. That's the way I always present it. I mean, a lot can happen in a 12-hour round-trip drive if you're going to be hunting for a doctor, 
especially if a child is sick and uh, or a woman's in labor. Either way, they could be at death's door. You know, there were women who died in childbirth uh, at a higher rate back in those days. It's kind of a delicate situation, and you know, not having the, the right people on hand could be very dangerous. So it was obviously a comfortable place to live a lot of the time, but in case of emergency, it was uh, you know that's when you really felt the isolation of the place. Well, you know, in, in general, it was a lonely life, you know, but there were the good times too. You know, in, in the spring, you would have the warm weather beginning to come back in. And sometimes you could have visitors at the lighthouse, which was always a kind of a treat because you didn't really see other faces for a long time other than your own. Uh, sometimes the people would spend the night and the keepers would put them up if they had the room for it, which here they did. Uh, in addition to the... Uh, original keeper's house, an addition was built onto it in 1838, which the keeper originally requested to have room for supplies and equipment, but he turned around and made it uh, use, useful for taking overnight guests and charging a few dollars along the way. So you got to admire his enterprising uh, approach to that. That was not actually uh, part of the job description. And after about right. 20 years of that going on out here, it was kind of the keepers were kind of told, you know, you're a lighthouse. I mean, you're not running a B and B out here. They had to kind of stop doing that. I know there was a light. I believe it was a lighthouse in Connecticut, where it was very similar. One of the early keepers uh, was taking guests in for from money and was ordered to stop that. <laughs> One of the keepers were, had to stop it because, uh, if I have the quote correct, he was also vending intoxicating liquors. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm sure mm -hmm. the visits were probably a lot of fun. But we have a guest register. We actually have uh, two types of registers that have comments that visitors made. And in just about every case, the people complimented the hospitality offered them by the keepers and the fine meals that were served. So that's a, that's a credit to the, uh, to the, to the uh, wife, I would assume, in those days, for, and maybe the daughters who uh, prepared the food. Uh -huh. uh, it was a compliment to uh, how much the visitors enjoyed it. I know uh, Portland Headlight in Maine, another one of the uh, earliest uh, lighthouses in the country, one of the early keepers uh, was known for his hospitality and they say would sell spirits, uh, probably rum, uh, maybe other things, but for uh, I believe it was three cents a glass to visitors. And uh, he was written up a lot in the newspapers uh, for his, his uh, wonderful hospitality. Yeah, yeah I bet uh, he was pretty popular. Yeah. And they say he saved the top shelf liquor for the local minister, by the way. <laughs> I've heard that said before, <laughs> that top shelf thing, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, how having visitors at the, the lighthouse was a treat for the early uh, keepers and families there. But when did the lighthouse transition into more of a, a tourist attraction? I would say probably around the, the 20s, late 20s. Uh, there weren't that many vehicles coming out here at that time. But, you know, because there wasn't a really that decent of a road yet, but the actual smooth paved highway that's here now, I hesitate to call it smooth paved. These days it's loaded with potholes, and hopefully they're going to address that later this year. But uh, a, a highway, a parkway, was built in 1930 to 31 by uh, a man named Robert Moses, who uh, was famous in New York as a master builder. He built many parkways and parks on Long Island, and he was widely known for that. And he developed the state parks in Montauk as well at the beginning in the 1920s. Uh, so the people had a place to go to to visit out there. And once that new highway came in, it's like they say, if you build it, they will come. They came in droves, which caused a problem at the lighthouse because in those days they allowed visitors to come on the property. And, it went, and if they did, the keepers had to stop their work, take the time to get into more presentable uniform, and escort the people up in the tower. They had to take people up in the tower, each group that came in. Imagine that today. <laughs> we could never do that today. Right. There'd be so many people. Uh, but that was what was required. And what got me was that the Lighthouse Service actually wrote uh, a, a negative letter to the keeper at the time, who happened to be Thomas Buckridge, and said that, you know, you're not keeping up with your work at the property. And his letter kind of said, look, I can't please you and the public at the same time. That, that, that's quote unquote, because, uh, you know, he would say, you know, you want us to make sure that people get the proper impression of the lighthouse station. And then on the other hand, you want us to do our work. Well, we can't do them both at the same pace. And they ended up giving him two uh, laborers 
at so many dollars an hour to take care of this work so that these keepers could properly greet people and tell them about the lighthouse, because that was the emphasis about the light service back then was tell the people about the lighthouse, tell them why you're here, tell them what the purpose is. And that's kind of in a sense what we're doing now. And there there was no other um, really significant building in Montauk to go to at that time. You know, it was at the time in the, in the thirties, you know, when Montauk was being developed by Carl Fisher, there were people coming in, in bigger numbers than, than there had been before. And really the, the logical thing to do is to see the lighthouse, which was the one thing that had that predated the one building that predated all the other buildings. So mm-hmm. yeah, when, uh, when Moses built uh, the state park adjacent to the lighthouse, that was called Montauk point state park. And then there was another one at the other end of Montauk known as Hither Hill State Park, which uh, featured camp areas, uh, a playground, the beach. So, you know, th- those two parks and the lighthouse kind of were the draws. And if you sure. stayed in Montauk and you stayed at that Montauk Manor I mentioned before that Carl Fisher built, he also built what was known as the Montauk Surf Club, uh, a golf course, a yacht club. And if you uh, bought uh, a week's worth of vacation at the uh, manor or longer, you got free access to those other uh, amenities. It was like a package deal. And, of course, a lot of the rich and famous were coming out here then. Some of them actually bought property out here. You sure. know, they had their summer homes out here. Speaking of how popular the lighthouse uh, has become over the years, how many how many visitors uh, a year approximately do you get? The of course this past year was was different, but in a normal year, how many people do you get there? Well, we kind of hover right around a hundred thousand. I I don't remember what the number was this past year, twenty twenty. I I want to say it might have approached seventy thousand somewhere in there. Uh, we were our our financial uh, member of the uh, lighthouse committee was very pleased with our numbers for 2020. He was quite surprised at how well we managed to do because we lost a couple of months, uh, not opening until mid-July. But the people came out in great numbers, and we were extremely pleased to see that. Yeah, well, that's that's impressive, very impressive. And, of course, the, the 100,000 in a normal year doesn't include everybody who just goes and, and uh, looks at the lighthouse and admires it without actually going in. Uh, the museum or anything. Well, there are people who admire it from outside the property uh, because when you're in the state park, you have uh, numerous vantage points that you can view the lighthouse as uh, nice photo spots, you know? Sure. Yeah. Occasionally people call and ask that question. Do we have to come on the property to see the lighthouse? And we tell them, no, I, you know, you get a better view of it on the property. Yes, but you can see it from outside and uh, get some decent pictures. Yeah. Uh, just to spend a little more time talking about the the human history there, are there any other stories of the the lives of keepers and families at the lighthouse that, that especially stand out for you? Uh, yeah, there's there's some, uh, and they kind of run the gamut. You know, some of them are kind of funny, some of them not so funny. Offhand, I would say like the prohibition years were c- kind of interesting in, in the twenties and into the beginning of the thirties because. Uh, uh, Montauk in those days was no, was said to be a wash in rum, and you know these small little boats would travel out to the twelve mile limit. Beyond that limit were the mother ships, which were loaded down usually with scotch or rum, and perhaps some other items. And these little boats would load up and then uh, basically uh, travel as fast as they could to outrun uh, coast guard vessels, many of whom were armed with machine guns. And occasionally it wound up becoming a uh, a bit of a naval battle out there. The keeper was uh, suspected of collusion with them. Uh, there was even a, a lighthouse uh, investigation done in 1925 where the head keeper was interviewed. Uh, conveniently enough, his son was the first assistant keeper at the time. And the two of them kind of played dumb because they, they, they claimed they didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, but after the investigation was over, there were some bottles found in an attic of one of the buildings, which the, an inspector said do not appear to be lighthouse issue. <laughs> <laughs> and it was said that the head of the uh, lighthouse service at that time was a man named Darn, I forget his last name now, George something, I forget. Putnam. But he, he said henceforth they will keep a watchful eye on the Montauk Lighthouse. That would be George Putnam would be the guy. Thank you very much. That's George Putnam. Uh, And he was a by-the-book kind of guy. 
And uh, I think he meant what he said. So that after that, the things kind of did calm down out there. Although there were uh, times when boats came ashore and the crew was drunk and uh, they were brought into the lighthouse to sober up. They gave him sandwiches and coffee. So as uh, you know, we've certainly talked about a bit, Montauk Point is uh, very exposed to uh, all everything nature can basically throw at it. And we'll talk about the erosion shortly, but uh, otherwise, aside from uh, the the you know the the ground er- eroding there, how has uh, the light station and uh, the point in general been affected by major storms like say the hurricane of thirty eight, for example? Well, overall, I would say the the lighthouse property has has weathered storms pretty well. I mean, the erosion factor, you know, notwithstanding, erosion was a constant factor from the beginning when uh, a survey was done at the point. In 1792, uh, beach erosion was evident and uh, reported. Uh, the man who uh, did the uh, survey was Ezra Longview, and uh, he said, as the bank is washed by the storms and sea, we suppose it best to set the building at this distance. That meaning for the lighthouse, and that distance was 297 feet in from the edge of the bluff. Today, that distance is roughly 100 feet or 95 feet at its right. closest point. However, it is 95 or 100 feet and holding because of work that began in 1970 to halt the erosion turned out to be very successful uh, until the last few years, which is why we are uh, embarking on a new uh, project to redo the uh, rock work all around the point. But to, to, to get back to the weather conditions, I mean, there were hurricanes that hit the point over the years, some of them did do damage to the light in earlier years. There was a hurricane of 1815 that knocked the light out. It didn't operate for a time. Uh, the great hurricane of 1938, uh, wind gusts on the hill there reached 150 miles an hour. Thomas Buckridge and his two assistants were there at the time. Uh, they and their families were not hurt. Uh, two of the families sought safety inside the tower itself. The walls are six feet thick at that level, so they were certainly very safe. Buckridge and his wife, they went in the basement and they rode it out down there. The house did sustain some damage to windows and shingles and that sort of thing, but uh, no injury to the people. When Hurricane Sandy came in in 2012, it did flood the meadow on the property there, which I had never seen before, and there were people who told me they had never heard of that happening before. That also had a very adverse effect on the uh, the revetment that had been placed there in the 90s. Some of the rock work was weakened and continued to be weakened uh, before and after Sandy, uh, which is why the uh, the new revetment project is underway now to replace those those rocks with larger boulders that are 15 to 20 tons apiece. Mm-hmm. So they're going to replace the... Uh, revetment section by section with these newer boulders and then use the existing rocks as filler. It's it's going to wind up starting further out in the water and curving higher up. So they're certainly going to have plenty of stonework to uh, accomplish that. Uh, the rocks, by the way, are coming from upstate New York. It's probably going to be a series of trucks that are going to bring them in. They think it's going to be a consistent flow of rocks uh, for two years, seven days a week, probably about 20 trucks a day, they estimate. It's going to be fun. Uh, so we'll get get back to the erosion here in just a, just a moment. There's a lot to talk about there, I know. But uh, this is a, a question for, for either or both of you. But the uh, Historical Society established a museum there, as you've mentioned, uh, at the light station after the, the light was automated in the 80s. I guess this is more for you, Mia. Uh, has the, do you feel the management of the light station property has been a, a good fit? basically, for the Historical Society? I think it's been fantastic for the Historical Society. And um, the museum is is an unexpected gem, I have to say. It sort of evolved organically, so it has a really personal feel to it, but there are so many important documents and items and artifacts. And, and the interesting thing is, you know, just sort of it, it, it focuses both on lighthouse history and on Montauk history. So there's you know, really kind of something for everybody. And it really tells the story really effectively. I So we're very, we're very proud of that museum. And I think in general, having the lighthouse for us 
Uh, it was a huge thing for the Historical Society to take on at the time. The Coast Guard wasn't sure that we were um, the proper people to take it on. There were several very determined women in the Historical Society who lobbied for this, and we were originally given a lease. And that was eventually, eventually we actually bought it. But we were given a lease, I think, partially because they weren't sure that we were <laughs> the best prospects for, for, for managing it. But it's it's been terrific for us. It really has. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah. and I think probably, you know, it is the number one tourist destination in Montauk now, as it was 100 years ago, except it means a lot more people now. And um, everybody who works there has a special pride, I would say, Henry, wouldn't you? Um, people just really, uh, it, it's its just wonderful to be connected with. So yeah, we're, we're thrilled to have it. If somebody was uh, going to, to visit the museum, what would you, if they only had uh, you know a short time to spend there, what, what are some of the highlights that are, people would see when they go there? Well, you know, as I said, it's, it's sort of got something for everybody. Um, I think uh, if you want to go and look at every single item in the museum and really study it, It'll take you a couple of hours, but you can have a nice little walk through it. And um, some of the features, obviously, the documents are fascinating for people who are interested in standing and reading and gazing upon George Washington's signature and, and Thomas Jefferson's signature and the original ad in the newspaper that was calling for um, uh, bids for the lighthouse of the, the specs were listed. I mean, these are really, really interesting things there. there. We also have really great dioramas showing the erosion and how that has changed uh, from when the lighthouse was built until quite recently. So that's sort of a kid-friendly as well as uh, it's just sort of an interesting um, and beautiful, uh, slightly, you know, sort of hands-on kind of, I mean, you don't touch it, but I mean, it, it was sort of hand-wrought exhibit. We have a fantastic diorama of Long Island with all the lighthouses and surrounding lighthouses. And when COVID is not an issue, it's interactive. So you can actually press a button and the little light on the lighthouse comes up and a, and a slide comes up showing you what the history of the lighthouse is. My kids, when they were young, could spend hours at that. And then we have, you know, our beautiful Fresnel lenses. Uh, we have a three and a half order Fresnel lens, which had been in the lighthouse from Henry will remember from ni- until 19, 19, 1987. 1987, from 1903 to 1987, I think. Uh, they're stunningly beautiful. People are always surprised by how gorgeous they are sure um, uh, you know i mean there's and then of course there's there are rooms of montauk history uh, our gil martin galleries are um tell the story of montauk from the montaukets through the development of, with carl fisher uh with a special room for shipwrecks and a room for f- fishing so there's there's really a lot of stuff covered and it pretty much tells the story of montauk uh, so if we get back to the the erosion for a bit, uh, Henry, you mentioned when the, the place was first built that there was an awareness of uh, erosion there, and that's why they built it as far back as they, they did. It's kind of a two-part question here. When did people really start being concerned, you know, that erosion was, was threatening the place? And the second part of that is when did anyone first start taking some kind of action to uh, to address that? I think, you know, at the beginning – it seems like the keepers who were there in the earliest times in, through the 1800s and into the early 20th century, any reference to the erosion problem was just a matter of what they measured. In other words, uh, oh, the lighthouse is now 140 feet away, and that was it. There was no nothing after that. There was no remedy that they might have heard about or were going to try. You know, They, they were just basically marking where the lighthouse was in, relative to the edge of the bluff. Uh, and that was all there was. So, you know, there was really no action, at least anything I've ever found, until the 60s, until the 1960s. Mm-hmm. The, the Army in the 40s, didn't they? I'm, well, I'm sorry. You're right. Uh, yeah, I did miss one thing. Uh, in 1946, the Army Corps of Engineers did uh, deposit a number of rocks on the beach uh, around the point, which really, looking back on that, really didn't do a whole heck of a lot because – the rocks themselves were not placed with any rhyme or reason. They were just dumped. And mm-hmm. with time, they basically collapsed on themselves and embedded themselves in that sandy beach. But in in the long run, they actually proved helpful because they helped act as a foundation for the rocks that were put there in the 90s. Mm. So 
Uh, but when you look at a picture that we have in the erosion room, you see those rocks. The, the photo actually takes the picture dates from 1950. And you see the rocks. And But what you also see is this bare, exposed cliff, which you know begs the question, well, what are the rocks doing for the cliff? You know, there's nothing there. I mean, the wind is still hitting it. The rain, the sleet, the elements are just pounding that cliff. And the rocks maybe are, are holding away some of the wave action at the base, but nothing is being done above. So by the, by the 60s, though, the Coast Guard was actually beginning to talk about removing the light from the tower and constructing a skeletal tower some distance inland and putting a beacon on top of that, and that would be the light going forward. And the lighthouse would just be left to the elements. Now, that plan did not really sit well with Long Islanders because the lighthouse itself has really been considered the symbol of Long Island since the 1940s. I tease visitors sometimes and I tell them, I said, if you don't recognize this, if you're from Long Island and you don't recognize this lighthouse, pack up and leave. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, shame on you. You should know the Montauk Lighthouse. There's all there is to it. Probably that sentiment was strong enough because thousands of people signed petitions to support saving the lighthouse. And it it, it took a, uh, a local newspaper publisher out here on the East End, Dan Retiner is his name. He publishes Dan's Papers. And uh, he started an, an event in 1967, which was called a light in. There was the days of love ins and be in. Yeah, and sure. You had you had Rowan and Martin's laugh in. You had John Lennon and Yoko Ono's yeah. bed in, wasn't it, or That's whatever right. it was? I love. I, I'm a personal fan of laughing. No, that cracked me up every week. Yeah. But anyway, it, it was the time of ins, and so Dan, I guess, jumped on board with that and began the laugh in. <laughs> Listen to me. Began the light in and. It amounted to a, a large gathering of people gathering in the state park parking lot across the street from the lighthouse with candles and flashlights mm. raised high in support of the lighthouse. Mm-hmm. And as he wrote at some point, a movement was born. And he held those light ins every year for about the next seven or eight years, I believe. It gained a lot of support and attention for the lighthouse to the point where the Coast Guard realized. They had a hot potato on their hands, so, and uh, they decided against this skeletal tower idea and kept the light in the tower. But it didn't solve the problem of the erosion because they really didn't know how to approach it. That wasn't part of their job description. And then, like, in the 11th hour, along comes this woman named Georgina Reed, who uh, had developed a method of terracing that was, I guess, somewhat unique because it received a patent it, it it had a drainage system. It involved the plantings of grasses and uh, shrubbery that had hardy roots that would help stabilize the cliff face. She uh, began this work on her own property elsewhere on Long Island, where her house was situated on a bluff very much like the lighthouse is. And she perfected it there. That resulted in the patent. And then she heard about the problem at Montauk Point. It wasn't a matter of the lighthouse approaching her because they didn't know her from a hole in the wall at that point. So she contacted them and said, hey, I can do this. Let me come out there. And a meeting was arranged. Fortunately, she did not hear a remark from one of the young Coast Guardsmen who said she's nothing but an old woman, which you, I came to understand later on that you didn't speak like that, anything like that to Georgina Reed because she had a fiery Italian temper. <laughs> And if you didn't follow her instructions right, she'd basically tell you in so many words not to come back because she did train people in the art of the construction of the terracing. She didn't do it alone. But that meeting with the Coast Guard was quite fruitful. The, they, the Coast Guard basically took the approach that they had nothing else. They had nothing to lose. So they, they gave her the opportunity because she had to get that permission. This was federal land at that time. And on April 22nd, actually tomorrow... <laughs> would be the anniversary of our, when she began the project, which coincidentally was the first Earth Day in the U.S. Oh, okay. So she began a, a campaign of 16 years of work 
until she was about 76 years old. That's when she was uh, 70. I'm sorry. She was about 78 years old when she retired. And the work didn't retire. You know, it's still, there was still more to be done. She had terraced 400 feet. There was still over a thousand to go, maybe about a thousand or a little less. And one of the members of those volunteers was a man named Greg Donahue, who is, to me, he is the foremost authority on this erosion story. Mm -hmm. If he were here, he would give you a story complete with details you'd be editing quite a bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. He gets rather passionate, and uh, we don't blame him. Yeah. He has fought long and hard for this project. He gives all the credit in the world to Georgina Reed for getting him started, teaching him. He changed some of her technique a little bit, but they used to argue about it. But at the end of the day, as he would say, it was always good because they loved and respected each other, and they knew what they were there for. They knew that this job meant a lot to them and to Long Island, and to the United States because of its historic significance. So when she retired, Greg took over, and he completed the terracing in 1998. But along the way in the 90s, the Army Corps of Engineers came out here and began to place the rocks that are currently around the point, began Mm -hmm. to put them in place. So in 98, everything was done. As part of a fundraising campaign, which was, was nonstop for this, uh, we An event was held in 1990 called Back at the Ranch. That was held on the property of Deep Hollow Ranch, or I think it was Indian Field Ranch, actually. Some uh, headline singers were uh, present at a couple of these events, most notably Paul Simon, who, by the way, has a place here in Montauk. So there was a probably some personal interest for him in that regard. So a significant amount of money was raised for the Montauk Historical Society, thanks to Mr. Simon and others. Billy Joel had uh, also sang at it. There's a, there's a list of a few other uh, famous singers who did appear over the years. Uh, the Back at the Ranch concert was actually a fundraiser which started out for the Lighthouse but wound up being for uh, other interests as well as the Lighthouse, uh, you mm-hmm. know, it, it, charitable events, things like that. It was, a, it was an excellent fundraiser, and it did draw a lot of, uh, a lot of people. I sure. don't attention to the lighthouse. Right. I remember as a longtime fan of Paul Simon, I remember all the and Billy Joel too, but I remember that quite well. I'm, yeah, I'm not that not that I was there. I wish I was there. Yeah, me too. I was in Montauk. I don't know why I wasn't there, but mm. um, but he was. It was a very kind thing for him to do, actually, and and it meant it meant a lot. Um, certainly in terms of goodwill and public relations, but also in terms of uh, money because he raised over five hundred thousand dollars for the lighthouse. Well, I think that was the key there is getting the word out, Mm -hmm. you know, telling people about what we were doing. You know, the the, the local paper here, Newsday, they did their series of articles as the project went along, uh, the successes, the the shortcomings, you know, the the word got out. But you could never have the word get out enough. And that's what we've been all about today with, uh, you know, public relations. That's why I guess I could go off on a tangent here and say how valuable Mia is. Hmm. Uh, because she is our public relations guru, <laughs> mm-hmm. and we are very so fortunate to have her with us. Oh, thank you, Henry. Uh, because you, you can't get the word out enough, and she's been doing that fantastically, if there is such a word. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is there is now. I think it fits. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned earlier the uh, the latest erosion control project. Well, maybe you can clear it up for me. I think it's it hasn't quite uh, actually started yet, right, the actual work? Is that right? They're laying the groundwork for it at the moment. You know, there's there's staging areas that have been blocked out. Um, a road has been sort of fortified. Um, well, Henry knows because Henry's there every day, and it changes every day. There's yeah, massive well, it, machinery. it really started a couple of weeks ago, maybe right, right around the end of March, where they started expanding this dirt path going down the side of a hill, leading to this staging area that it was created. Uh, so they had to widen that roadway, gravel it over, smooth it out, grade it so that the slope was not as steep. And then they cleared an entire area for uh, e- equipment. It's amazing. That's the only word I can think of. It's just amazing what, what they're starting to do. There hasn't been that much activity in recent days because the, the area has pretty much been established. Uh, the other staging area, which is on the north side of the property, this one's on the south, uh, they're going to start that in the fall, 
and that's going to affect areas on the north side, but we're not thinking about that yet. It will uh, have an effect on the entrance to the property for visitors, but that will be successfully laid out so that there will be no uh, risk to any visitors entering our property. And the lighthouse will stay open. I yeah. just want to say as, as well, you know, we've had these sort of uh, attempts at creating revetments in the past, but the thing that's really interesting about this is that they're using so much technology in creating the revetment, in engineering it. Uh, they're using GPS to figure out exactly how to place every rock. Uh, and they're going to be doing a little bit of excavation in order to place a sort of, you know, foundation. It looks like um, it's going to be a really, really great project, and it should save the uh, the lighthouse, at least for the foreseeable future. And then, of course, there is the other project, the uh, tower restoration. That's been going on as well. That They're in the midst of that now. They've already had two years of that, where they are scraping the paint off the entire tower, repairing cracks, and then resurfacing the tower with a very powerful, strong, uh, weather-resistant coating, which will make the tower look as it does, you know, white on the top and bottom with the brown stripe in the middle, which is called the day mark. Phase one of that restoration was carried out. Uh, well, they, in- phase one was the, mm-hmm. was the uh, lantern. Okay, they yeah. They did that at the beginning, and that came out beautifully. Well, yeah, and the reason they, they started there was that um, there was a lot of water infiltration that was coming in through the lantern, um, you know, the, the, where the metal was a little bit degraded and so on. And so that that actually water was flowing into the space between the inner and outer walls of the lighthouse and causing a lot of problems with dampness. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they started with the lantern. And apart from anything else, it is so gorgeous now that um you know it was really wonderful that they that they started there because it was a it was it, i think it just made everybody's hearts sing to see this beautiful uh, restored lantern sure and we've been telling visitors that ask us about it i said if you think the lantern looks beautiful i said wait till you see what the tower is going to look like it's going to be look like an, an unwrapped gift <laughs> so when is all the rest of the work happening what's the timeline for well that? right now uh, as we speak uh they have completed the scaffolding, this bridge bridge scaffolding, uh, which they had up last year. So they came back to install that first. And five of the eight sides of the octagonal tower have already been scraped. So there are three to go, which they will tackle. Then the repairs of the, uh, of the uh, cracks will be taken care of there. And then after a period of time, uh, they will begin the coating, which we were told will probably take place by next year. Mm. Yeah, that should be completed by uh, by the end of next summer. But, you know, it's amazing to me when I go there and we're, you know, they're using all these, they're, they're using technology, but at the same time, this is hand work, you know, so they have these lovely lifts that take them up the side of the, of the lighthouse, but then there's with the chisel, they're chiseling away at the, at the mortar uh, repla- where they're replacing all the, the mortar that was put in to repair the lighthouse and they're replacing it with lime putty, which is probably what was used originally, uh, which is a more breathable um, and a less, less hard surface. Um, it turned out that the, 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 the substance they were using actually was causing the rocks to degrade because it was so, because it was so hard itself. So um, yeah, they were using Portland cement, yeah. which was mm. not uh, what was supposed to be used in that sandstone. This was pointed out by a consultant that kind of uh, is where some of the work is involved. It's amazing. You go up there. I remember going up on a, on a foggy morning one morning and there was somebody up on the tower and you could barely see him in the fog. And you just heard this little chink, chink, chink as he was chipping at the, mm. at the, um, at the mortar. It was lovely actually. Mm-hmm. So uh, the museum, the lighthouse will remain open through all, through all this. Is yes. that right? The museum and lighthouse aren't really affected particularly by the tower restoration, except, you know, they're scaffolding up, uh, sure. not, not all the way up the tower. Um, but so, you know, you're aware that there is work being done. The revetment is, is going to make things a little bit different in terms of we may, we, we may have to shift the entrance uh, to the property. We're not quite sure about that yet, I don't think. But um, we will remain open uh, through yeah. that as well. Yeah, the work is all exterior, so uh, under normal conditions, people climbing the tower would be able to, but because of COVID restrictions, the tower climb is not available. Well, it's going to be an interesting couple of years there, that's for sure, and uh, I'll have to visit visit you at Montauk uh, maybe after all that work is done. 
Well, I'll tell you, in my 21 years there, I have never been witness to anything this extensive. It, it's just phenomenal. But it, it's work that's necessary. Yeah. It is yeah. absolutely necessary. And it's befitting because we are a National Historic Landmark. And only 11 other lighthouses besides us can say that in this country. Right, right. Yeah, it's a very uh, high-level distinction for sure. So I, ha- I have just a, a couple more questions uh, for both of you. And these questions are for bonus points, of course. So yeah. uh, get your, your number two pencils ready. Okay. Uh, obviously, a lot of what you've both already said points to the, the passion you have for the, the place. Uh, so these questions might be a little hard to answer in a few words, but uh, you can uh, you know fight amongst yourselves as to who's going to answer these questions first. But first of all, <laughs> What is so important about Montauk Point Light Station? This is actually the first question is a two-part question. What's important about Montauk Point Light Station, and why do you feel it needs to be saved? Henry's gesturing, kindly gesturing Ladies to me first. to begin. <laughs> first of all, it's historically significant. It was, you know, it, it's the oldest lighthouse in the state of New York. It's the fourth oldest operating lighthouse in the country. And there are a lot of other firsts connected with it, and his, there's historical significance. But I think most of all, It is such a powerful symbol for the people of Long Island and actually the people of New York, and I would go so far as to say the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, It's a place that creates very, very powerful emotions in people. And I remember watching a commercial, uh, like a PSA during, in the beginning of COVID, and they were trying to, it was a news station, and they were putting across, you know, this sense of like, we're all in this together. And they ended with 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 a shot of the, of the Montauk Lighthouse. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I just wept. It was so, it was so powerful. And it was that sort of that understanding that it, it's not, we all see this as a symbol of stability and safety and safe haven and home. That's why I think it needs to be saved. I'll be perfectly honest. I can't add to that. <laughs> I, I can't. You, you said it all. It's perfect. I mean, it is significant to Long Island. I've always felt that way. Ever, becoming a landmark to me is the thing that it really is the most significant beyond New York it is, uh, nationally. Yeah. And, and because you, you don't become a landmark unless you've been recognized as contributing to the history of the country. That puts us on a bigger stage. And that's why, I mean, I've, I've said even to our staff, I, it may sound hokey, but I said, take pride in where, where you are. Because you, you're you're in a you're in a special place. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, what else, what else can you say? And, and convey that to visitors that you're in a special historic place. Definitely, and you know everything. All your answers and the the books you've written, you know, speak to that uh, that um, the importance of the place and your own passion for it. So I think. Well, personally, you know, I am proud to be associated with it. I mean, I've never been prouder of any job I've ever had in my life. Sure. Well, uh, that leads into my my last question for both of you, and you've already uh, at least partly answered it, both of you really. But let me just ask you, what's your favorite part of your involvement with Montauk Point Lighthouse? I think for, I think for me, it's, it's, it's emotional. It's uh, being involved with the preservation of this landmark aid to navigation and seeing the effect that it has on other people. It's just, it, I, I, I never fail to have my spirits lifted when I go to the lighthouse, uh, especially when there are people on the grounds and you see how they're reacting to it. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm tearing up now as I'm talking about it. Well, I understand. Well, I, I think it's, for me, it's, I'd say a little of that, yes. Uh, but also it's, it's the visitors, it's the people that come because, uh, I, and I've said this many times to our visitors that it, it, it's the people that make us happen. You know, without them, we don't exist. We, mm-hmm. we, we were, a, we're a landmark. Yes, we, we, we would just be a, a quiet, closed up landmark if uh, visitors didn't come and visit us. And uh, I think it's because I spent so much time as a tour guide. I love talking to people and talking about the lighthouse because uh, – it's fun. I mean, it, it, it never gets old, and which is something I've, I've said to the staff many times. I said, some of them have been there for many years, too. But I said, you, you've said the same things over and over again to people. 
But just remember, every time you're saying it, you're saying it to someone new who has probably never heard it before. Mm -hmm. So it always, always has to sound fresh. My philosophy personally was always that when they walk out the door, that they can look back and say, wow, what a great museum this was and what a great time I had. And speaking as a historian, that they learned something about it. And that maybe they'll tell others and they'll come back and see us. I'd also like to add that we're so lucky in the people who work at the Lighthouse Mm -hmm. um, because everybody has, I think I alluded to this earlier, everybody shares this um, pride and passion for it and it shows and it show and, and and we've had a lot of comments from people who've gone through the museum to say how how much the visit meant to them because of the interaction they had with the with the guides well you know that that pride and passion is extremely clear with both of you uh, and i think uh, everybody listening uh, would agree with that and uh, I hate to to cut this off because I feel like we could talk for for hours more. And we have to feel, yeah, well, it feels like we've talked for a few minutes, but it's been uh, close to two hours. And I, I know people are going to enjoy listening to this. It's it's really a pleasure uh, talking with with both of you. And oh, uh, you too, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you for. for uh, you've, us. You're very very welcome. And uh, you know, I just want to recommend to people that they visit. Uh, Montauk Lighthouse and Museum because it is one of the the prime lighthouse destinations in this country. And uh, you and everybody else there does such a great job. So again, I want to thank you so much. And I hope we can talk again sometime. Uh, Mia Chertich and Henry Osmers, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again to our guests, Mia Chertich and Henry Osmers. For more on Montauk Lighthouse, go to Montauklighthouse.com. In the next episode, we'll discuss another iconic lighthouse, Old Baldy in North Carolina, with two guests. Thanks to all the members, volunteers, and staff of the U.S. Lighthouse Society around this country and the world. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about everything the Society offers. And remember that donations and memberships support this podcast, as well as all the other preservation and education efforts of the USLHS. If you volunteer or work at a lighthouse, thank you so much for what you do. Everyone involved with lighthouses and everyone who works to save history of any kind are all on the same team. If you listen by using Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. And as always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Yeah.